I do a lot of consulting with prospective clients where it's kind of my job to figure out if they need my help or not. And some people I say, look, you're not ready for paid. And it's usually because they're too early stage. They don't have the budget or like resources to commit to something like that. But then the later stage you get, paid can become a good channel for you. Every B2B marketing team faces challenges when they have to do more with less. Should you build skills internally? Should you find a freelancer? Should you search for the right agency? This is Tech Qualified, a podcast for the scrappy B2B marketing teams. In each episode, Meredith Metzger, a senior content leader at a tech company, and Justin Brown, a marketing agency owner, uncover how marketing teams generate qualified opportunities with limited resources. Every episode helps you get one step closer to winning over your ideal customers. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tech Qualified. I'm Meredith Metzger, and I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Brown. Hello there. This show is brought to you by New North. New North specializes in working with B2B marketers who have to do more with less. When you partner with New North, you turn your small, scrappy marketing team into a growth engine. So for this episode today, I am super excited to welcome Nick Lafferty. He's a freelance growth marketing consultant and works with all kinds of companies to help them with demand gen, Google Ads, and just basically building their paid programs from the ground up. He's also the founder of Early Exit Club, a weekly newsletter where he documents his journey as a solopreneur. I get it every week. Love it. So Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk with you today about a topic that I know is top of mind for a lot of small scrappy marketing teams out there, and that's how to build a paid program from the ground up especially when you don't have a lot of resources and maybe you've never even done paid ads before. So Nick, I know you've helped a lot of companies do exactly this, build a paid program basically from scratch. So to kick off our conversation today, I kind of want to first zoom out for, you know, again, those small scrappy marketing teams who maybe are like me and just don't have a lot of experience with paid ads. Maybe they don't understand the importance of them. So in your mind, why is it so important for companies to invest in a paid program? And how can they know if that's even the right strategy for them? Yeah, I think the the probably the number one answer I would give to that is the speed that which paid gives you feedback on so you can iterate and like optimize from there. And so with something like SEO or content, there's definitely a longer term horizon for when you'll know if it's working or not. But with paid, you can put a couple hundred dollars in, a thousand dollars for a weekly test on one channel, on a couple of different channels, and you'll get results back really quickly. And so a lot of the first exercises I do with new clients or just with like prospects as I'm going through the discovery process is figure out, you know, what's their business, what's their goals, what have they tried and they kind of match those with what I think the best fit channels are for them. Sometimes it's Google. Sometimes it's more paid social. Like I see a lot of and do a lot of LinkedIn ads too. And so like matching the right channel to the right company and like what results they're trying to get is kind of the first step in the process of like building a paid media program from scratch. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. It's an opportunity to test ideas quickly and with a relatively low investment, at least to start with. Like that's, there's a lot to that. That's worth a lot, especially if you have a small team, you're just trying to figure out what works for your audience. Maybe you don't know yet. I can see how paid ads would be a great way to just sort of start iterating. Yeah. And some of the easiest tests that a small company could do, and it's, I'm a big fan of repurposing existing content. And so if you have great SEO content, then awesome. You you probably have some idea of what keywords are working well for you, what keywords are maybe more challenging for you to rank for in Google. And then that would be a great time to test running paid ads on those keywords. And to, also the more bottom of funnel they are, the better. A lot of my clients where they run a foul with paid ads is they start like super broad, super top of funnel and they get clicks, but no conversions. And that's the opposite of really what you want to do. And so starting more bottom funnel on search, competitor keywords, 
problems that people are looking to solve is definitely the, the right place to go. And then if you have LinkedIn content, if you have a leader or a CEO who gets LinkedIn, who gets the value of organic social, you can go into LinkedIn ads editor and take a couple hundred bucks and boost one of their posts to exactly your core persona. Like you can plug in target companies and job titles and senioritys and even like company sizes of like, you know, companies from like 100 to 500 employees, like whatever your kind of core ICP is. And at that point, you're paying to get your content in front of your target audience. And that has a lot of value and like brand awareness, but also in like, you know, conversion metrics too. Yeah. And that was going to be where uh, I was going to kind of start the the conversation is just how do you identify which channels, uh, which paid channels that someone should be focused on, whether that's pay-per-click, LinkedIn, pre-roll ads on YouTube. I mean, where, how do you prioritize where people should begin with their investment? Yeah, I am a little biased because of my my background. Like my background is in Google ads first, and then I've gotten more into paid social LinkedIn ads, the more I've gotten into like demand gen for, for B2B SaaS. And so typically if a, a client or just anyone I know, if they're not fully like optimized on those two channels, those are the easiest first places to start. Google ads and search ads in particular is the lowest lift channel from a resourcing perspective. Like you don't need visual creative. You just need a couple of words and a place to send people and like, you know, what, what your ad looks like. And that's, that's basically what you need to get started on, on Google. And so if you're not doing Google ads, it's a very like low lift way of just getting something. Uh, and then that opens the door to a lot of other, other places, but I typically start people in both of those two camps. It's also where I'm best at too. It's where my skills are deepest. And so I want to be able to serve my clients or if I'm at a full-time job, I want to, to do that too. But I would start there and then kind of like work your way out. And that, that could be over months or quarters too. It's definitely not like a, you know, Google ads this month, LinkedIn next month, Reddit next month. It's, it's too quick of a pace for sure. Yeah. And that, that leads me to my next question, which is going to be a loaded question for you here, Nick. So I work with a lot of companies that in many cases are either scarred by marketing. They're small marketing teams, sometimes founder led marketing or like one person in marketing. And they're terrified to put budget to paid efforts because maybe they tried that tried it at one point. It didn't turn into anything that they felt was a value and they're nervous to invest. When would you say is a good time for a company to start investing in paid? And then caveat to that question is really the identification of the budget for the channels that they're going after because there's like that threshold, right? It's like, if you don't put in enough money, it's not going to do anything, but yet you want to test and you're scared. And it's like this entire, like you got to jump in, but what if we jump in and bad things happen? So how do you help people to identify when they're ready to start going into paid channels? Yeah. There's, there's definitely a threshold in terms of, I work a lot with startups and venture backed companies. And so there's definitely a threshold of, are they late stage enough for this to make sense for them mm -hmm. to run paid ads? Like if they just raised a seed round or they just graduated from like Y Combinator, then like probably not the right time for, for paid ads. Like you want to build the product more before you kind of take a leap down here. But if you're later stage, a lot of my clients are series A, series B, series C. It's kind of the one, it's my sweet spot for success, but it's also where I found where the appetite for testing paid starts to increase. They start to have more funding, so then they can put more budget towards things. And so I will say within the realm of paid, every paid ad platform has a bunch of pitfalls that you can do unknowingly that will spend a ton of your budget and not get you any results. Like these pitfalls exist in Google and LinkedIn everywhere. It's as simple as like, if you don't uncheck a box, LinkedIn will show your ads on their audience network, which is garbage. And like, that's going to get you terrible, terrible results too. And so there's not like one specific answer. And a lot of my work now is it's, I, I, I do a lot of consulting with prospective clients where it's kind of my job to figure out 
if they need my help or not. And some, some people I say, look, you're not ready for paid. And it's usually because they're too early stage. They don't have the budget or like resources to commit to something like that. But then the later stage you get paid can become a good channel for you, especially if you kind of stair step your way up and don't just say, Hey, I'm going to dump 50,000 into Google ads this month. Like, how do we do that? Like I would probably advise a couple thousand and then like start to, to ramp up over a period of weeks or months on Google. There is more of a minimum threshold on LinkedIn too. It's like five to 10,000 is generally what I recommend people getting started with on paid social. Cause that's, it's just a whole different beast in terms of getting your brand in front of a cold audience on LinkedIn versus Google is much more higher intent. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the actual dollar amounts. Like I'm taking notes over here because like I said in the intro, like at Uconnect, we've experimented a little with paid ads, but it just hasn't been a priority. And I have been curious kind of what that threshold would be to get results. Like how much do we have to spend I yeah. spend money to make money, right? <laughs> yeah, Meredith. I mean, that's it's it's funny you bring that up, Nick. I mean, that, that's about what we're seeing a, as well, right? Like, I had someone reach out to us recently, and they they're like, "We're doing 1.2 million per month in paid," and I'm like, "I'm not fit for you." <laughs> yeah. We're we're an agency that works with small marketing teams of one to five at B two B tech companies in many cases. And Nick, I'm not sure how much overlap you and I have, but like we're working with companies that in many cases aren't like the super like VC backed. We just got $50 million and we need to spend it. My client is much more along the lines of like, we've had a successful business for five to 10 years. We're looking to level up marketing. We want to grow more quickly, but this is like our money not, you know, Alphabet gave us 300 million and we need like super fast growth tomorrow. So we're just going to dump crazy amounts of money. And so like when someone comes to me for 1.2 million in a month, I'm like, hey, we're not a fit for what you're looking to do. But conversely, what we are seeing with those types of clients are like, like 2,500, 5,000, 7,500 up to like 15 grand a month is most typically where we play and you can really test some things and, and find some things that work. So I'm seeing, uh, I just wanted to bring that up, Meredith, because you mentioned, you, you know, taking notes and I know the audience is probably similar. I'm seeing the same thing too. I mean, it's a, it's a good threshold to really get that flywheel going where you can have a paid presence. Yeah, for sure. Kind of on that note, Nick, I'm, I'm curious, let's say you're working with a small marketing team that they are interested in paid. They want to start looking into that, then maybe they're having a hard time getting budget. <laughs> Is there like, what would you recommend to them as they try to advocate for starting a paid program? Yeah. It's the budget conversation is really tough. And it's funny because I have this conversation across all of my clients where when I come in, I will ask them like, what's your current paid budget? What's your goals? And then, you know, if we hit those goals, like what does that mean for unlocking additional budget? And the way I structure my fees is um, I don't do a percent of ad spend. And so if my client grows, they spend more money, the, my, my fee is a percent of their ad spend gets smaller. <laughs> so they're not disincentivized to, to grow. But it, in terms of unlocking additional budget, the way I approach this is it's all experimental is look, I'm looking for a couple thousand dollars to test and validate if this channel is going to work for us or not. And when I was at my last full-time job, I worked at a series A startup that was pre-revenue. So they like literally had not launched a pricing and packaging. Like you couldn't pay them even if you wanted to. And yet I was still running paid ads there because they were about to launch pricing and packaging. And they wanted to know when people can pay us, what are some possible channels that we can turn on and really ramp up to see if like this will turn, you know, have a good like, you know, payback period for us. And so I went to them and I said, look, I want to test three channels. I want to test Google. I want to test Twitter and I want to test TikTok. And I need, you know, a couple thousand dollars in a month to test all of those. And like, here is what I'm looking to see. Like these are the metrics I'm going to measure. These are the types of campaigns I'm going to launch. I'm going to use this creative. And a lot of this, I had the liberty of ask, like I knew what to ask for because I've been running paid for a while where someone who hasn't run paid wouldn't know like, oh, here's the metrics and here's all of this stuff. It's like, the point is 
I went to them. I said, I want to test these channels over this time period with this budget. And like, I'm hoping to learn this at the end. And the founders were super bought into that idea. And surprisingly, Twitter ads were amazing for them. I had low expectations for Twitter and it it crushed. I wouldn't have learned that had we not tested. And so again, it comes back to experimenting, learning, because a lot of what I found is companies, there's like typically one channel that is working for them now. And then it's the perpetual struggle of like, what is next? Like what channel comes next that we can bolt on to kind of really exponentially grow and not just linearly grow. And that comes from like adding on new channels. And to find that you have to test and spend a little bit of money to figure out what that is. Okay. Yeah. As, as kind of a follow-up to that, I, I'm curious, how do you determine if a channel is working or not? Yeah. And so usually you go into it, you have a budget, And step one is you're just trying to get conversions, whatever your conversion is. It could be a sign up, it could be a lead, it could be webinar, it it could be whatever your normal kind of like goal that your other channels are measured on. And so when I'm going in there, I'm like figuring out if any of these channels can drive conversions at all, because some of them don't, it's, or it's, it's, or it's too expensive. And so if you figured out they can get conversions, then it's a question of, okay, how much are you paying per conversion? And when you go and do these tests, you typically will set up a couple of different smaller tests within it. So if you're in Google, you might have four keywords, five keywords that you're you're bidding on and you put some dollars behind them. They get conversions. They will probably have different metrics that, you know, they all have different cost per conversions there. And then you say, okay, is this cost per conversion acceptable to us? Is it based on a, you know, LTV to CAC payback period? Or, you know, is it a six month payback period? Or like whatever you're measured by looking at the results of those things and then comparing them to like, okay, like, how is this going? Are we, are we okay with this? Does this back out from a revenue standpoint? When I was at Loom, we had a, we measured all of our paid programs on a three-year LTV model, which it it seems kind of insane to like, you you get a sign up today and we're expecting that this person will pay us for for three years. And it's a little, a little ambitious, but (laughs) you're ultimately measuring kind of outcomes and then saying, is this acceptable or not? How much, how low can we get this? And those exact dollar amounts just depends on the economics of the business. All right, Nick, I got a I got a question for you off the off the heels of something that you said. So you mentioned that in most cases a business is already doing something well, right? Like especially in my case, like companies are coming to us, they're spending between eight and thirty thousand dollars a month on marketing with us, not paid, just like with us as a client. To do that, they have to have a legitimate business, right? So most people come to us, just like you said, they have a channel that's already working. So I have a scenario. It's a real scenario, and I want to know how you answer this question. <laughs> so we have a client came to us. I'm not going to name them by name, but they hold the first spot on Google organically on like almost every money keyword in their space. They've been around for a long time. They just have like long-standing, great SEO, and we were tasked with running paid for them. Our ROAS are like 10x spent. So like we're getting 10x return on all of our ads. From our perspective, we're doing a great job. We're like, this is amazing. For every dollar you put in, you're getting $10 back. The client at times will say things back to us like, well, we would have gotten that purchase anyway. Because they're the first spot in Google. So we have, and we had someone else on the show. He actually works for, for New North now, who sponsors the show, works on my team. And he said one of his strategies was to, a different company, but he said one of his strategies, he was the organic content guy at a company called Mosaic and his counterpart, who was the paid guy, like their, their goal was to be for ad and then first spot on Google. We're in this situation now where we're like, okay, you were first spot on Google. Now we have ad and we're being told, well, we would have gotten it anyway because we're the first spot on Google. So what would you say to that? If you're, you're the paid person, you feel like you're doing an amazing job. You're looking at the return on your ads. They're, they're fantastic, but you're being told you don't get the credit for 
the results. What are what goes through your head immediately? What are some yeah. of your thoughts? I'm dying to know. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I've, I've run into this a few times too. And so I, I tend to lean on, on the data a lot. And so there used to be really nice reports in GA's universal analytics that would kind of show you like the, the path that people would take of maybe they clicked on an organic piece of content and then paid and then ultimately converted. And like that stuff was really helpful. I haven't spent as much time in GA4 to like say with certainty if like that exists in GA4. I don't think so. And so like that, those like user paths are, are really helpful to tell that story. I've been in the biz enough for a long time to know that generally the more visibility you have, the better across, across everything. But then there are times where you don't want your ad to show up at the same time of an organic result. And for me, it's usually around branded search too. Mm. And so at Loom, I would run branded ads on the Loom keyword it get a ton of conversions and then I would turn them off and the paid conversions would go away and nearly 99% of them would just funnel back to the organic side. So I was just like shifting, shifting budget around without really incrementally driving anything else. And so like really understanding the true incrementality of, are we getting more net new people or are we just shifting numbers around from organic to paid is probably like one of the first things I would look at in the scenario too. Cool. Yeah, no, it's always good to get other perspectives because it, it is, it is tough. It's like, you know, when you have, when you've done so well in one lane, then you try and introduce this other lane. You need to make sure that it's also driving its own things. But at the same time in marketing, as I'm sure every person on this recording knows, like you're looking for things that work. And when you see that it's working, my immediate reaction is like, okay, let's see how much we can do until it doesn't have a 10x return. Like, let's keep going. That would be my initial reaction. Not everybody, uh, you know, there's not unlimited money within organizations. So that actually leads me though to, you know, as we're talking about multiple lanes, I want to pivot this in a little bit of a way, kind of what we were just talking about, but how do you integrate paid with other marketing efforts? So you talked about just now, like, making sure they don't cannibalize each other. And that's what we were talking about just now. But if we take that a step further and we talk about how you use pay to really enhance other marketing efforts, what are some of the things that you're doing there? Yeah. So one of my favorite clients and all of my clients are my favorite clients, but you have a favorite child, of course. And one of my favorite clients, the CEO really gets the value of organic content. And there is an existing organic content team that is empowered to just do cool stuff. Like they, they make physical books and send them to people. They do really interesting marketing activities because the CEO has given this kind of unhinged Canadian content guy, basically free, free reign to do cool stuff as long as at the end of the day, they can tie it back to generating leads. And so this makes my job as the paid person so easy. Because I think the hardest part of doing paid is coming up with unique campaigns and strategies and ideas, and especially as a consultant or an agency. I don't have as intimate knowledge of the business and their market and their unique positioning as someone internally does. So I take their great organic content that they put out on uh, LinkedIn organically, Instagram organically, a few other places. I put it on LinkedIn ads and just put a few dollars behind it and just put some wind in the sales. And the ads that they come up with that I end up using are way better than what I would make myself as the paid person. And so like they do off the wall stuff. Like they protested the ad week conference in New York. They compete a lot with Dropbox as a product and they hired a bunch of senior actors to protest outside of ad week and like hold up all of these signs and said like drop the box and all this stuff. And then they gave me all these video assets and promotional materials. And I just take them and put them in front of their target buyer on LinkedIn and it crushes it. It does so well. And I feel like I'm cheating almost. Cause all I'm doing is just like dialing <laughs> in the persona and putting $5,000 behind it. And it's amazing, but I couldn't do that without the value of organic content. And so at this point, I tend to start screening a lot of my new prospective clients on 
what is your organic content strategy? Because that powers so much of what makes a good paid program successful and not boring of like, oh, come get a demo with us. Like, no, show me some cool stuff, like stand out. Uh, and so I couldn't do it without people like Meredith who do cool organic content on other channels that then I could repurpose. Yeah, that's a theme that has come up in this podcast a lot so far is that it all kind of begins with good organic content. And from there, you can build pretty much whatever you want. Yeah, it, Nick, when when people come to us, because, you know, there, there's agencies out there that are just like, we just will do paid, we'll do some, you know, light creative, and we'll run your your PPC or we'll run your LinkedIn ads or what have you. And when people come to us and they're like, I don't want any content, I just want you to run ads, we're like, we're not a fit. Like, we have to create these owned experiences that people will actually care about because uh, we're not just a paid agency. I mean, we do a lot for our clients and and our kind of philosophy, it sounds like you're kind of getting there in your own right too, even though being more on the paid side is that we really don't bring people on who don't see the value in good content because we just don't believe that we're setting ourselves up for success. Then you're just trying to game an algorithm and hope that people convert and you just don't see yeah. that as a long term way to be successful with ads and there's such a higher likelihood that someone's gonna be like you wasted our twenty thousand dollars over the last four months and i'm like we didn't have anything to say to anybody yeah the the i came up in a lot of like b2c lead gen for home services like i was slinging hvac replacement leads window replacement leads to contractors for five years and that's where i learned how to do google ads and like in there you can like kind of get away with not having a brand, not having a perspective on the market mm -hmm. and just like putting dollars behind it. But in like B2B SaaS where, you know, dollars are, you know, more difficult and you're marketing more to businesses, like having a unique perspective and interesting things to say is going to what makes or breaks your paid media program. And it, it's part of why I don't typically do visual creative for my clients. I say like, I need you to do this for me and I need it to kind of come from you because you're going to make something that's 10 times better than what I can do because you have a product marketing manager who owns the positioning and the messaging and you know how to speak to these people and I need to leverage that to be successful. So I'm 100% in the same boat. Uh, kind of on that note, I, I'm i curious from your perspective and sort of to help our audiences listening to this, what do you consider to be organic content that is good enough to merit putting paid behind it? Yeah. It's it's a hard answer to say like specifically like this makes or breaks organic content. I think is it interesting? Is your audience reacting and engaging with it organically? Are you seeing good results from it? Is it cool? Is it fun? Like do you, do you enjoy making it? Is usually the heuristic I use. Like if it's fun for the marketing team to make it and put it out and they're excited by it, then awesome. I'm stoked to take that. If it's just kind of generic white papers, ebooks that just like don't have a unique flair. Like I'm less interested in that kind of stuff. It's, it's very, very subjective, I think. But if a good content marketer is proud of what they put out there and they really think it'll resonate and like, that's the only litmus test I kind of, I need on my end to say, this is good enough to try. I love that. I have the same motto. It's like, if it's fun to create, it's probably fun to consume as well. Yeah. So I, I, you've talked a little bit about like what you look for in terms of results, measuring success. What, and kind of on that note, what do you think is most important to measure? And then how do you, how do you report that out? And that, or how do you recommend your clients report that out? Yeah. A lot of the clients I work with, they're nowadays, they're more sales led than they are like PLG or kind of self-serve. And so the most important metric to them is open pipeline created within the quarter. And so that's what I kind of try and measure myself towards too. Of, yeah, I can get leads. There's a million ways to get leads in B2B SaaS, but do those leads show up to meetings? Do those meetings turn into opportunities? And then what's the dollar value of those? And so that's a lot of the reporting and metrics that I do. And I try and shoot for a five to 10 X pipeline of like five to 10 X more in pipeline than we spent on, on paid ads. That's kind of the, the goal that I shoot for across 
many of my my clients. It takes a lot of steps to get there because then I have to know that the leads that I'm bringing in are high quality enough and have high enough intent to to book a meeting. I have to listen to call recordings to figure out like oh like what's important to this prospect. You know how do I incorporate that back into my my ad copy? But like that's generally how I look at. Reporting. I'll meet with my clients in the beginning of an engagement once a week, and then move that to every other week going forward. And then it's like very simple. Here's what we spent since we talked. Here's the results. If I have access to HubSpot or Salesforce or whatever, I'll pull the pipeline number myself or ask them to send it to me. And then it's a summary of here's what we've tested, here's what we've done, and here's what we're going to do in the next couple of weeks to see how that works. And the sweetest feeling, I just had this with one of my clients two weeks ago, is you hop into a call, you've iterated through a bunch of paid media campaigns because very rarely the first thing you try is what works. Like it's almost always like thing number five or thing number 10 that like really works and clicks because you've learned this worked, this didn't work, let's, let's you know, test this thing. And two weeks ago, one of my clients just opened to their first two dollars of, of pipeline, not literally $2, but like two deals that turned into, into dollars of pipeline. And it's the sweetest feeling when that happens because you've iterated through so many things and you found a thing that works and it is proven and there's dollars attached to how much that thing is worth to that business now. And I think I'm hooked on that feeling because it's, it's hard to get to that point. And so I love when that happens. Yeah. And on that tracking and attribution kind of component. One of the things that, you know, we've run into for sure when working with varieties of different companies, and you kind of mentioned it is just the different ways that different organizations track things, the ability to actually be able to sometimes have CRMs that are updated in a timely fashion and data being real. How do you overcome some of those things? Yeah. So again, someone in a fortunate position where I screen for those when I'm looking at prospective clients. So I need a marketing operations person. You kind of need to have a CRM that's reasonably updated. You need to be able to tell me with confidence what your attribution model is, which companies that have tried these things before have like at least some of that stuff in place. If you're starting a paid media program from scratch, then again, it's it, some of those that stuff might not exist. CRMs might not be updated. Salespeople aren't always the best at updating records after they've had a call. And so, like, what do you do in the, in that scenario? And it's just a lot of questions. And it's I ask a lot of questions of my my clients too. Of like, how are things going? How do you measure results right now? Like, how do you tell where leads or signups come from? And at first, I will typically integrate into whatever existing system they have. And then the deeper into the engagement we get, I'll start making suggestions like, oh, can we add a self-reported attribution field on the form of like, how did you hear about us and make it open text and use this GPT to go through and like categorize all these responses and do that kind of stuff. And so like eventually you can kind of get more, more complicated, but like the data and reporting piece is really hard. And if a client doesn't have CRM or it's very messy or there's no marketing operations person, I'm at the point now where I, I pass on those engagements yeah, because I, I I've said you. yes. And it's, <laughs> and it's, it's painful. And like, I yeah. try and avoid that. And again, I'm in a different scenario where I can kind of say yes or no to things as a consultant, not a full-time person, but it's a challenge. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that's a lot of the stuff that we see I, and I, and I'm, you're probably like, why? Do you put yourself through this? But I do the work that you turn away, which is people come to us. And in many situations, we either, if I were to ask 10 people at an organization what a lead is, I'll get 10 different answers. They don't have it well-defined, what sales might consider a lead versus what marketing might consider a lead versus what the CFO would consider a lead could all be different things. There are situations where we don't have access to like the actual CRM that sales is working out of. So it is, I mean, it, it, it's tough at times to be able to come up with what those reporting pieces are. And, and one thing that I can echo that you, that you mentioned is, you know, it is asking just a ton of questions, really trying to understand the customer journey. How does somebody come into your organization? How do they engage with the organization? Where do we go in terms of creating an opportunity? And then how do they eventually 
become a customer. So I think there's like levels to it, but you know, some of the stuff that you mentioned, I think is kind of where companies should strive for when it comes to paid, but you know, there's, there's certainly, there's certainly layers to it. Yeah. Well, and like the, the thing that I've learned too, is that nothing happens overnight. Like if you look at a, you know, gold star paid media program run by, you know, a really good team, like that wasn't an overnight success. Like they started somewhere, tested the thing, found some data issue, fixed it, scaled. And so there's like, there's a, a journey that these things go on. You don't need to expect to have like everything perfect before you you press go. A lot of times it's a slow evolution of a program. The way you report things evolves over time. And then that just gets better the longer you try in doing, you try, you do some of these campaigns, but it's hard. Like the data and attribution is like one of the hardest parts of running paid then you get executives who come in and start asking very pointed questions of like how are things going what's the roi on this and i try and avoid a lot of that by being more proactive but yeah it's tough yeah i i'm glad you brought that up because that was like my next question is how how do you explain this or how do you help the marketing teams you work with explain that it will take some time this is not an overnight thing like the ceo has to be patient Yep. This is probably the biggest mistake I made when I was more junior in my career is like I I moved very quickly and I would set the wrong expectations with my manager or like their boss of how quickly we would see results to, oh, you know, we'll, we'll know by next week or next month, like if this is working or not. And then that time would come up and I'd be like, I need more time. I don't know. And so like setting the wrong timeline expectations early on really did not set me up for success. And so now I try and do that a lot with all of my clients of like, look, this isn't an overnight success story. A lot of my initial engagements are three month minimum in the beginning, because I know it's going to take time for us to get into a cadence. I need to learn your business. And so like within a quarter, I think you should reasonably be able to see something of is this working? Is this not? Is this worth investing in more? And in many cases, it has worked. And then in some cases, I've had clients where the first three months, it didn't work out for whatever reason. And we say, okay, cool. We tried. Thank you. You know, See you later kind of thing. And so it's all about setting the right timeline expectations and then just keeping people proactively up to date on what you're doing, what you're testing. When people have to come to you for updates, I found that that is when they start having concerns about what's going on. And so anytime I have this like voice in the back of my head of like, oh, it's been too long since I proactively set an update on what I'm doing in performance, let's get that out there because those proactive updates show that I've been doing something, I'm learning, we're trying, we're seeing results. And so you kind of have to do that internal marketing when you're in-house of like how things are going because no one else will champion your work except for you. And I do that as a consultant too. Yeah, I just wanted to applaud that. Like the proactive communication, I feel like is just so critical to any marketing endeavor. I find it all the time as a content marketer. I'm like, this is what we're doing. This is the results we're seeing. I'm not just sitting around, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, because I really dislike when, executives start like asking very public questions about what's going on. Like I've had really bad experiences there. And so I want to get ahead of that. Like I kind of want to control the narrative a bit more. And I find that I can do that from a better place if I'm the one who's being proactive versus like reacting to whatever VP or CEO is like asking of like, oh, what's going on? Like, why am I not seeing results? Like I'd rather control the narrative more in the same way that if you're building a competitor page of like you versus them, it gives you the chance to really build the narrative around like who you're a good fit for and who you're not a good fit for. It's like the exact same thing for internal marketing too. And I've stepped on some landmines there. And so a lot of my experience is not wanting to step on those in the future too. Yeah. No one wants to be called out publicly at a meeting or in Slack. That's for sure. (laughs) It's the the worst. (laughs) Okay. Well, I want to start kind of wrapping this up, but before I do that, Nick, is there anything else that you would like to add about building a paid program? Yeah. I think the the takeaway I would give people is just, just try. And if you can't figure something out, Google it, ask a friend, ask on LinkedIn, post in a community of like, Hey, I want to test running LinkedIn ads or Google ads. Like where's a good place to start? 
You might get some consultants like me who like very softly pitch you like, oh, I'd be happy to help you. But you'll also find people that will genuinely help you too. And I built my whole career off of running paid media programs. I've been doing this for the last 10 years. And everything I know now is because I screwed something up before and learned from it and do it, do it differently. And so that's all part of the process of just trying and iterating and changing a thing and launching it again and putting some dollars behind it. And then when it works, it's great. It's worth all the like trial and error in the beginning, but yeah, just, just try and figure it out and it'll probably work out in the end. Yeah. Well said. It's like a big science experiment. That's what I'm thinking of. It reminds me of like sixth grade science class. Yeah. You have to have a hypothesis, then test it, then test it again, then fail, then test it again. That's exactly it. All right. All right, cool. Well, Nick, thank you so much for joining us on Tech Qualified today. This was a fun conversation. Like I said, I've been taking notes because this is something I know we would like to eventually look into on my team. So thank you for your time, for sharing all your experience and your wisdom. And thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you all next time. Thanks for checking out Tech Qualified. This show is brought to you by New North, a marketing agency that helps turn your small, scrappy marketing team into a growth engine. To find out more about New North or check out more episodes of this show, go to newnorth.com slash techqualified.